Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate. Today I'm interviewing Louise Marburg. Hi there. How are you today? Great. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm pretty good. Thank you so much for being on. I'm so excited to chat with you. I I read your book a few months ago, actually, and it was so excellent. I, I'm just like, still, I, I've still been thinking about it. Um, so actually on that note, can you tell me about your book? Well, it's interesting. This book is interesting to me because it's not, I don't write thematically. I don't write link stories or I have it yet. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I had written a bunch of stories, say three or four stories that all had swimming pools in them. And um, I realized that I was kind of going on a swimming pool binge and uh so I wrote some more and I, I really, there are only, I would say, you know, half of the stories that I insert swimming pools um, on purpose. It was just obviously some kind of unconscious obsession on my part. So that's how that happened. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if you want to know about the title. Um, oh, I do. I, I actually do. Yeah. Okay. Well, the title, No Diving Allowed came from a mentor of mine. I told him that I had some stories that had swimming pools in them and I didn't know, but I thought maybe they were going towards a collection. And he said, I have the perfect title. And I said, great, what is it? And he said, no diving allowed. And I said, well, that's great. I love that title, but I don't have a story called no diving allowed. And usually collections are are entitled, that there's a title story in a collection. So there would be a story called No Diving Allowed. So I didn't, you know, I didn't really think about it after that. And then a few months later, I was writing the story that became No Diving Allowed, which is about um, a pair of siblings, a a brother and sister. And uh, the brother does a cannonball in the local club pool. Mm -hmm. And suddenly there was a lifeguard there. And this happens to me. Things just happen in my stories that I'm kind of unaware of, but obviously aware of. Some, some level, there was a lifeguard who screamed, no diving allowed. And I thought, oh, my God, Eureka, I, I have this, the title story. So that's how that I, I love that so much. And I love that it um, kind of came to you because like you had that title, someone suggested it, mm-hmm. and then it like appeared in the story. Um, yeah, it was cool. That's that's really interesting. Um, and something interesting in the book, too, is like how swimming pools represent different things in different stories and like how it is all connected with that thread. But the thread means different things. Um, right. right. Every swimming I, pool is different. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, can you tell me a bit about how you discovered sort of like the deeper meanings of the swimming pool. As it well, were. it's it's interesting because every swimming pool in in the uh, collection, I say that there's swimming pools I have known. So um, I there's there's no swimming pool that I'm not familiar with, uh, including the one in Africa, which is exactly oh. as I described it. It was it was sort of dug out of rocks and it was very odd. But I wh- the way I write is very intuitively. I write I, very slowly for the first few pages I try to figure out what my characters are doing and saying and um, just slowly slowly then I kind of you know write to see what's going on I write to that and then I would say halfway through I I figure it out I know what I'm doing and I see the connections I've made and uh, and then I write the rest of it it's it's and that happens pretty quickly compared to the first half of the story which is you know, incredibly slow. So um, that's how I write. And so I'm not really even aware of what I'm doing in, thematically until I'm, the story tells me. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of want to elaborate on that a little bit, like what you were saying with the how you aren't necessarily aware until mm-hmm. like as you're going along. Can you tell me a little bit about that and how that affects your writing process? Well, it's great because... Um, I just, I start with a seed of something like a memory or a visual or something I've overheard. Um, It's usually something very simple that I just start with because it intrigues me for some reason. It's kind of a hook. You you know, you know, when something's hooked you that you're interested enough in this small thing to, to keep on. Mm -hmm. um, So that's, that's what happens to me. And then I, I broaden out from there. So 
um, let's say the story identical starts with um, the suicide of the uncle of, of a guy. And uh, I was, I was interested in the idea of a guy that nobody likes committing suicide, but that turned into a story that was not about that at all. It was a story about twins who hate each other. Um, but that's how I started. That was the seed. And then it, it grew from there. So that's, it's, it's, you know, some people just say that their characters do surprising things. And for me, that's very true. I, it's, uh, I never really know what's going to happen in the next few paragraphs or even lines. Yeah, I, I definitely feel you on that. Um, whenever I've written before, I, I always have that where it's kind of like those aha moments yeah. as you're writing. So I want to talk a little bit about how you structured this and like how you decided where to put the stories, like what order to put them in. Um, oh, that's also kind of interesting. Yeah. I have no I have no idea how to do that. I get too close to them. Uh, I did put them together myself. Um, I have a number of readers and uh, one of them said, you know, this is, this is too, begins too quietly. And I don't, I think, I don't think you should have these stories in this. Um, you know, I think you should have uh, something else as the beginning. And I didn't really trust her to, uh, she's not a story writer and I didn't trust her to order them, but I have a, a cousin who's a theater director. He's really a, big supporter. He reads every story I write and he, I just trusted him to do it. So I gave it to him and he ordered the stories. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> I, I, I never knew anyone, um, like that I've talked to on here that has done that. And that's really, that's really cool. Um, I have another book coming up that I gave to, uh, somebody else to order the stories. I think it's really a good way to go because they see, themes and uh, in in the stories that I don't see or just mm -hmm. ways to connect them that I don't see so and also if you're doing it yourself you might subconsciously be like oh well this is when I wrote them so I have to like put uh -huh. them in, in chronological order or something yeah. like that um yeah. or, or I like this one better and so I want it here or whatever and you know what how I feel about this story is not necessarily has anything to do with the merit of the story or how other people are going to like it so mm -hmm. uh yeah, I'm not, I don't think I'm the one who should, should be ordering them. That's really cool. Um, so did you write this book one story at a time, or did you find yourself working on multiple at once? I know people who do multiple at once, and I'm jealous of them, but I write one story at a time. I don't write slowly, so that's good. Um, I, I can write a story within like six weeks, I would say, six weeks to two months. Um, mm -hmm. So... I, you know, maybe it ends up being the same if somebody's writing five stories and it takes them six months. I don't know. But uh, um, yeah, for me, it's one story at a time. I, I and Between stories, I'm completely bereft of ideas. I'm just like, oh, my God, I'm never going to write another story. <laughs> but I do. Mm -hmm. I, I feel you on that, though. With, the, with writing, that happens to me where I'll be like, um, oh, my goodness, I can never write another thing. I don't know how I ever wrote anything. I have no ideas. And then a month later, I'll be writing all the time. And also the feeling that, oh, my God, this is so hard. It's just too hard this time. I can't do it again. Mm -hmm. and I do. You know, it's just all of that. I mean, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, uh, Oh, yeah. Do you have a favorite of the stories in the book? I don't really have a favorite story. Um, I, I'm kind of partial to the bottom of the deep end because it's the first story I wrote and um, it's probably the most serious story. And I'm, I'm kind of fond, I'm fond of the main character. I feel very tender toward her, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty equal opportunity with my stories and characters. I don't, I don't really favor one over the other. Some are more fun to write than others. Some are more difficult, but uh, you know, once I I've done them all, I, I just feel incredibly proud that I've been able to do it. Yeah. What well, what was it like getting in the headspace of these characters? Because a lot of them are wildly different and so many different scenarios and like different backstories. It isn't like, um, a, a book or a collection of short stories where it's all set in one space yeah. or where they all have like something like that. Um, yeah. So how did you do that as an author? 
It's it's what I've always done. The past two books I've written, it's kind of, all the stories have been very different. Um, and it, I like that. It's like inhabiting a different person every time. It, it's almost to me like acting in a way, but um, I like the, di- then I think this is why I write short stories because I like different characters all the time. I think if I wrote a novel, I just get bored with the characters after, you know, a certain amount of time and <laughs> novel years to write. But um I just do it. I don't know. It's, I can't describe it, but it's not, it's not uh, as if I do any research about a character or anything like that. It's like, they're all taken from bits from people I've known or people, you know, people I've read about or, you know, just bits and pieces. Interesting. Yeah. I love that idea of like taking um, bits and pieces almost. Were there any parts in the book that like you had almost like an Easter egg in kind of alluding to someone that the story was based off of or something like that. Uh, uh, No, you know, uh, let me just think. Uh, No, I don't think so. I don't really, it's never, it's never absolutely somebody I know. It's, it's usually somebody and somebody else and somebody else, (laughs) you know, (laughs) all put together or just the type of person that I, you know, maybe grew up with or, um, or like that. It's it's never just one person. I, I don't know why that, you know, I know people do that, but I, I don't know that I would find it that interesting. I suppose it, it would feel a little odd because then it would be like I'm like writing fanfic about someone you know almost. Yeah. And and there's you know, there's less movement. I mean, if you know them, you know what they're gonna do. And I I, I really like not knowing what my characters are gonna do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned that you like to kind of go into it where like, you don't know what the next sentence is going to be. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Do you plot out a character's backstory or what's happening? Or do you kind of um, learn it as the audience learns it? I learn it. I don't know. as the Yeah, I learn it as I write. I mean, I, I wrote a story recently where the character all of a sudden had had an abortion at 16. And I, I had no, <laughs> no idea that was going to come up as backstory dropped in. It was, I dropped it in and uh, I thought, well, this really works for this character. I mean, this is the t- you know, it's just perfect for her. And um, so that's how it happens. I guess I get to know the character and then I kind of, you know, just drop in things that are likely and move from there. That is really cool. So has your background and like education and design influenced your writing in any way? You know, it influences how I feel about my covers, but, um, (laughs) you know, I mean, communication has always been important to me and design is communication as is writing, but they don't, they have not intersected for me in terms of, you know, one feeling like the other or, or yeah, it's just two different things entirely. Yeah, you know, that that does make sense. But I kind of want to continue what you were saying just then about um, how it's still like it's communication. Um, Mm -hmm. I I love that. I love that, like the idea of like so many different ways in the arts are communication. Um, And when you have like one skill in one area, a lot of times it will transfer over to the other because Mm -hmm. it's it all kind of boils down to that. And, you know, I know a lot of writers who are terrific uh, visual artists and um, although not really the other way around. My husband is a painter and I mean, really, it's his writing is ridiculous. I have to write everything for him. (laughs) Um, But I do know a lot of writers who who can paint and draw. um, And, you know, certainly I know a lot of extremely articulate and intelligent designers who for sure could write a book Mm -hmm. if that was, you know, what they wanted to do. Yeah. So were you always interested in writing? No, I wasn't. I went to art school for graphic design and that was my trajectory. And uh, then I just, I thought, well, first of all, I don't want to be my boss. I sort of came to that conclusion. I had Mm -hmm. always uh, read short stories. I love short stories and I always wanted to try my hand at them. So I just did it. I started writing. I I went to like, you know, um, a class at the new school, for, you know, for adults, and and finally ended up going to Columbia for my MFA, and it was some risk because I had never written before, and uh, it worked out, you know, but uh, it it may not have, but I wanted to at least give myself the opportunity to try it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. W- like when you were a kid or anything, were you? No. <laughs> no. Oh, really? I just did um, art. I was, tell- you know, visual art all the way. So it's it's odd because I, everybody else I know, you know, they journaled and they wrote poetry and I'm completely a, a, a one trick pony. Also, I don't write, write poetry or essays or any of that. Um, yeah. So I just, uh, I just happened into it. I guess, you know, uh, people don't do the same thing all their lives. And I, it was just sort of kind of a cleaving of one profession into another, although I don't know how, you know, I don't, uh, writing is not really a uh, job that makes you money for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I really fascinating though that you weren't interested in it because you're really a brilliant um, short story writer. And a lot of the times um, when I find people like that, where it's like, oh my gosh, this writing is like incredible. They usually started at a young age. Um, no, I, I, re- yeah. I read a ton. I've always been a huge reader. And I think that that's incredibly important for writing, for people who want to write. And I'm always amazed when I encounter somebody who's learning to write uh, that they haven't read as much as they should. I I mean, I've read so many short stories. I continue to read them all the time. And I read them for pleasure. I really don't think, oh, how's this structured or anything like that. I just love them. I love short stories. Do you have any favorites or any that kind of inspired stories in this book? Any, any stories that inspired stories in this book? Mm-hmm. Um, I have authors that inspire me, but in, as far as stories in particular, no, I don't think so. I mean, there was a period when I was in graduate school where I was dying to write like a row and I kept writing these really long, boring stories that were in no way like Alice Monroe. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just realized, you know, at some point you just realize you have your own voice. And so I don't, I don't feel like my stories, perhaps they are, but I, I'm not recognizing that my stories are like anyone else's. But I, I have um, certainly authors that I revere and would love to, to write like, uh, you know, or at least be as, as masterful as they are. Mm-hmm. Could you share some examples? Well, I really love Deborah Eisenberg. I really love Jill McCorkle, um, uh, Tessa Hadley. Gosh, there are just so many. I can't even think of them. Well, John Cheever is an you know early, early one. Peter Taylor, Mavis Gallant, Alice Monroe, um, William Travers. So those are all sort of early. Uh, Doris Lessing, little known that she's an incredible short story writer um, or was. Uh, and nowadays, it's more like, I always would say, um, I really loved, uh, I don't know if you read this, we love Anderson Cooper. Did you read that book? Oh, I, I did not read that book. That sounds interesting though. It's just so funny. And because I write, hum- you know, pretty humorously, I really love funny short stories uh, that aren't too funny, obviously. And certainly hers, uh, R.L. Mays has wrote that book and certainly her stories aren't just hilarious. They're about serious things. But uh, I, I do like stories that have a, a sort of, funny sad thing going on uh so even though they're not necessarily at least from what I read um they weren't necessarily all like laugh out loud but it was like there was a humor to it in all of it which I I think is one of the most important things in writing because I've read a lot of books without humor (laughs) yeah and they are not fun (laughs) they're gloomy aren't they yeah Mm -hmm. um no I I think there's humor in everything so it's hard for me not to put humor in my stories my next book which will come out in about a year Mm -hmm. um is the editor said it it was laugh out loud funny and I thought wow I didn't didn't know it was funny so yeah well Well, I'll be excited to read that one um (laughs) I'll definitely be on the lookout for that um and if you want to come back on the show to talk about that you're of course welcome back on um yeah can you actually tell me a little bit about that book that book uh all of the stories of protagonists are women uh not not for you know I'm not I don't know that I'm saying anything about life as a woman but that is turned out to be the the link between them Mm -hmm all different. I mean, 12 year old to a 90 year old. Um, and yeah, just basically doing, you know, the domestic life to office life to, um, you know, single married family, sex, you name it. I just like covered the gamut. That's, it's mm-hmm. very, uh, 
it's less linked in a way than no diving allowed, uh, I think. But I never think my stories have anything in common. Then somebody points out that, oh, oh my God, they have everything in common. So <laughs> I don't know. But uh, it's called You Have Reached Your Destination. And a lot of the stories are about the end of life. Hmm. That's yeah. not, that really interesting. And it doesn't sound funny. So does it? It, sound funny. it doesn't, but, I, but I'm, <laughs> I, I, have, I have faith in the humor. Um, <laughs> so did, was that title inspired by the um, end of life? Well, the, it, it's, it's a title of a story in the collection, and that was about the end of someone's life. There's also a story about a nine-year-old woman who, who, you know, she doesn't die in the story, but it's clear that she's going to die. Um, it's there's a lot of loss in in this collection. Now I'm just making it sound so gloomy, but it's it's really not. Um, and so, you know, just the idea that what where you are or what you're doing is where you're supposed to be, whether it's at the end of your life or you know, you're in a situation, you've reached your destination. I, I love that. Um, I like that. It's, it's like, um, essentially like no matter what, like it's like almost like a fate type yeah, thing. Right? Exactly. Uh, and I'm a big believer in destiny. So mm-hmm. I same. Um, that's, that's really, really interesting. I'm, I'm going to definitely be on the lookout for that one. <laughs> well, it's coming soon. My God, I had no idea I'd have book two books so close together, but there it is. Well, that's what happens. Um, and you know, like what you were saying too, it's, it's, you don't know where it's going to take you and like, you don't necessarily know what even the next sentence is going to be, but. No, you really you know, have no idea. And it's, it's true about placing these books as well. I've, I've not used the same publisher twice, which is mm-hmm. actually I would prefer to stay with the same publisher, but it's not always possible. Um, and you never know, you know, who the next publisher is going to be, even though you might think, Oh, I wish it was, you know, Lala Press or whatever. It's it's never that. It's never the one you want. It's just mm-hmm. so you know this random thing that then turns out to be either either an interesting fit or a really good fit or you know whatever. There's always something to be learned or enjoyed. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, do you have a favorite short story that you've written ever? I know I asked about specifically in No Diving Allowed. But mm-hmm. you do have another book out. You have one that is coming. Um, yeah. Um, I would say, and I don't necessarily think it's the best story I've ever written, but it is my favorite story. It's called The Truth About Me. And it's a title story of my last collection my um, that was published four years ago. And it's just, um, it's about a, gu- a guy who's mentally ill and trying to make his way in life, trying to you know, be a, be an adult, be a human. And he's trying to hide his mental illness from his community, but they basically know and accept him. It's, it's a really sweet story. And I, I just have always loved it. I've always loved the character. That sounds so cool. Yeah. I was um, doing some research for the interview today and I saw that that was your previous work. And in there, just hearing that title, it made me want to check it out immediately. Um, I, I have not read that one yet, but once I saw that, I was like, that is such a great title. And I love that it's the title of the whole collection too. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually, I mean, for me anyway, the title of the whole collection is usually the title of one of the stories or it always is for me, but mm-hmm. I don't know if that's true for everyone, but it is for me. I, I always love when that happens in books. Cause I feel like a lot of the time you can kind of see what some of the author's intentions were with the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, a lot of times, like I read this incredible poetry book um, and called Small Altars. And I just had her on the show. Um, and in it, there's a poem called Small Altars. And that poem I kept going back to because it like, it really signified kind of like what the whole collection was. Right, right. Yeah, that's, I think you do choose or I do the um, certainly with the truth about me, that that book was everybody kind of it, it, many, many of the characters were mentally ill and they were coming to terms with the truth about themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, no diving allowed. Um, you know, there's a, the uh, there's a sense, I think in many stories of um, things that are happening that are not supposed to happen. 
um, or, you know, that are not outrageous necessarily, but just not, not right, not normal. Yeah, definitely. Um, One of my favorite stories in the book, and I cannot remember what it was called, um, but it's the one where the, I'm trying to be very vague so as not to spoil, um, but you'll know what it is. It's the one where it's the one mom, and I believe it's her sister that comes to with her kids uh-huh and really? i really oh i love that story oh wow that's really interesting because um you know when you have stories you place them in journals and i could never place that story <laughs> it's like, it's oh. just, nobody would take it um i like it too i think it was it's you know i love the tension and and i, I think sibling relationships are really intriguing so um yeah that and you know, there is a lot of drama in that story as well. I'm glad you liked it. I, it was, I thought it was so interesting because how I'm once again, trying to be vague. So as not to spoil, but um, how the one sister just had her stance and would not budge. And honestly, the other one, it was the same situation. Um, right. But I, I thought it was interesting because I'm an only child. Oh. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. But I, but I have had, a lot of siblings in my life that I have done mediation for (laughs) kind of. Um, And so hearing that it was interesting to see that dynamic that I had seen play out with people that I had been close to before, but never quite lived. I think sibling relationships are really most intriguing. Uh, And I write a lot about siblings I have uh, four siblings, but I usually write about two siblings. I, I think that the two sibling relationship is very uh, dynamic and interesting. Because mm-hmm. you always hear about the three sibling relationship. Yeah. Right. Because it'll be like, oh, there's the oldest, then there's the middle, then there's the youngest. Right. But you don't always hear about the two sibling unless they're twins. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, I have twins and no diving allowed, but I also have, mm-hmm. you know, just... Just siblings. Um, yeah. a, a couple of, a few of them are siblings, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know what? I think that is actually all that I had for you today. But thank you so much for coming on the show. This was so great to talk to you. Oh, it's It was terrific to talk to you. And thank you for having me. And what a terrific podcast this is. I well, hope to keep so you again. Much. Yes, same. Anytime if you would like to come back on. Um, I just have one last question today. And that is, what do you have coming up? I have a collection in which the protagonist is this nutty woman who lies about herself just for fun. And uh, I've just, I've just gotten into it and she is so much fun to write and I'm writing it in first person present, which is present is unusual. Interesting. Yeah. First person is always fun, but Mm -hmm. present is, I don't know why I started it that way, but I did. And it's working out. So it's, it's really in its infancy, but that's what I'm working on now. Oh, that sounds so cool. Well, if you want to come back on and talk about that, if you want to talk about any of your other books, standing (laughs) invitation, this was really great to chat for read between the lines. My name is Molly Southgate. And I'm Louise Marburg. Let's end this the way all great stories end. happily ever after the end. Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. You can follow the show on Instagram and Facebook at Read Between the Lines Podcast and on Twitter at RBTL Podcast. Make sure to follow the authors who I've been talking to to hear all about their upcoming projects and also because they're cool people. This show is hosted by me, Molly Southgate, and produced and edited by my dad, Rob Southgate. Read Between the Lines is a Southgate Media Group production, and you can find all the great content put on by the network at southgatemediagroup.com. You can read the story of how I and many other podcasters started in the anthology book Pod Life, which you'll find at the link in the show notes. Also in the show notes are links to buy the books featured on this episode. Using those links supports this show and the incredible authors being interviewed. Have a great week and keep reading.